world to come together individually. This is the Passover of the Lord. If we honour the memory of his death and resurrection by hearing his word and celebrating his mysteries, that we may be confident that we shall share in his victory over death and live with him forever in God.
It is very meet right and right that with the service of our lips we should glorify and should praise with heart and soul God the invisible and almighty and likewise his only begotten Son Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour. O night verily blessed which did spoil the people of Egypt and magnified the Hebrews. O night wherein heaven and earth are joined and mankind partaketh with the Godhead. We pray thee therefore, O most merciful, that this candle, which we have lighted and consecrated before thee in thine own name, may continue to shine forth without ceasing, and may vanquish all the shades of darkness, that being accepted before thee as a sweet savour, it may be numbered with the lights that thou hast kindled. May the day star find it burning when he dawneth into day, and the day star that riseth and knoweth not his going down, but coming forth from the place of darkness, gladly giveth light to all creation. We beseech thee therefore, O most merciful, that thou wouldest direct and guide us, thy servants, and the hearts of all thy faithful family, and, also that, and those also that minister in thy service, especially thy servant Sarah and Robert, our bishops, so helping us with continual grace, that we may pass our time in rest and quietness, in the glad solemnity of our redemption, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Mediator and Redeemer, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. And it came to pass 
Let us pray that God will give freedom to his enslaved people. The God who has ordained thy mighty works of old should enlighten even this our present generation. Who didst by the mighty defence of thy right hand deliver one people from the persecution of the land of Egypt to be a figure of the salvation of all nations by the washing of regeneration? Grant, we pray, thee that the fullness of all mankind, being delivered from its present bondage, may be made sons of Abraham, worthy members of thy true Israel. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us pray. Lord of all life and power, who through the mighty resurrection of thy Son hast overcome the old order of sin and death to make all things new in him, grant that we, being dead to sin and alive to thee in Jesus Christ, may reign with him in glory, to whom with thee and the Holy Spirit be praise and honour, glory and might, now and in all eternity. Amen. Amen. Ready? 
raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been reunited with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. For we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The Lord be with you.
I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, please be seated. Jesus is alive. Let that sink in. Let me say it again. Jesus is alive. Jesus is resurrected. Death could not stop God. Indeed, death has been defeated. For the next season, we're going to be using the words Alleluia. I can say that word again. It's, I've not been able to say it throughout Lent. It's fabulous. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Alleluia, it demands our response. Alleluia, because this is life-changing stuff. The most earth-shattering event that has ever taken place, we are celebrating in this place tonight. And as we heard the resurrection narrative just now from Mark's Gospel, I wonder what resonated with you? What stood out for you as we gathered listening to those extraordinary life-changing words that we've just had proclaimed? Have a think for a moment. What is it that stood out for you? Can I share with you just three brief thoughts, reflections that I've had about this particular reading? Let's think about those women, shall we? Mary Magdalene, Mary, and another, a number of other people. Now this is a group of people, of course, a group of women who'd seen Jesus die. They were there. They'd followed Jesus for a while and they'd even seen where the tomb was. So they didn't have to ask directions or anything like that. And they knew that there was unfinished business going on. This is where Mark stands out a little bit because John's Gospel says that all that preparation stuff took place before Jesus was put in the tomb. Here, in Mark's Gospel, it's slightly different. And the women are on a mission. They go with these spices. And the Sabbath has now come to an end. Passover rather has come to an end. And it is time for them to go to this room to go and anoint the body. Now what I love about listening to these women on the road is that they have wonderful intentions about what it is they're about to do. But like many of us, our intentions are great, but they have no strategy. I love the conversation that's going on as they make their way to the tomb. They're deeply, deeply upset. They need to go and carry out this anointing of a dead body. And they speak to them, each other, on the road, and they say, who's going to roll the stone for us? They've not thought ahead. The intention is there. They've got a task which they need to carry out. But they've not thought it through properly. I wonder in our reflections about whether that's a metaphor for you and I. What can we learn from those women? What can we learn from their way of doing things? Because I just wonder sometimes we get so caught up in the minutiae of the strategic detail that we lose sight of the big picture the big story. And what I think these women are teaching us is that actually God provides. God provides. Who's going to roll a stone away so that we can go and anoint the body? Wow, it's already happened. God is there in our Christian journey, always one step ahead. And sometimes we can get ourselves caught up on so much of the detail, we don't realise that. And so these women are leading us to Jesus. Do you see that? They're leading us to that relationship with God, with a God who loves us so much that he's always one step ahead. 
always there. Not always making things easy for us, but he's saying to us, I think, tonight, don't lose sight of the big picture. And don't get so caught up in the minutiae of detail that you miss the big picture. That's my reflections on those women. There's something here about their ministry being intentional. They knew what they were about. They had a task. And that leads me on to my second reflection, because as the women got to the tomb and they realised that the stone had been rolled away, they go into the tomb and they realise there is a young man sitting there. And this is when it's good that they ha- are not so caught up on the minutiae of detail of their strategy, because suddenly their task has to change. They meet with this young man in the tomb. And the young man says, why are you looking for Jesus in this place? Here, look, I'll show you where you... You were there, you saw him going in. And they realise that Jesus is not there at that particular moment. And then, of course, he gives them a new task to do. This young man gives them a new task. The new task, of course, is to go and tell Peter. Go and be an apostle. Be one of those people who actually proclaims the good news of the resurrection. Here were these women being sent out by this stranger with a new task. An extraordinary task. This young man has the most incredible role. Thankfully, they're not caught up so much on the detail that suddenly they go, yeah, this is our next task. The first ones to be sent with such good news. Now, there's an interesting thing about this young man that we sit here. That we, that, that we greet in this tomb. Mark, in his writings of this gospel, uses a very particular word when describing this man. Neoniskos is the word he uses. Neoniskos. And it's an extraordinary word because it's only used twice in his gospel. And of course, Mark chooses his words, like all the gospel writers choose their words, with extreme care. The other time that we see Neoniskos being used is as Jesus is being arrested in chapter 14. We read in Mark's gospel that there is a young man who is caught up in the scuffle, and as he is caught up in the scuffle, someone gets hold of his clothes, and he runs off starkers. That's what happens in Mark's Gospel as Jesus is being arrested. There's a young man, a Neoniskos, who ends up running off completely naked. And it's the same word that Mark uses now, after the resurrection, as those women enter into the tomb. Well, what's all that about? Well, I wonder, my second reflection, I wonder if Mark is using that word because he's thinking of you and I. You see, when we come face to face with the crucifixion, with the events that lead up to Jesus' arrest and his trial and his denial and uh, him being denied and him being whipped and flogged and all that sort of thing that we read about in the Gospels, which then take Jesus to the cross, we see in that whole journey, it's like looking into a mirror. And we see the messes and the mistakes and the brokenness of humanity. When I read through those those actions of, of, of people, people like you and I, caught up in those moments that we read about in the New Testament, it's as if we see ourselves caught up in those crowd scenes. The times we try and cover things up, the the times we try and walk away and say it's not our fault. All the sort of stuff that you and I do on a regular basis. Let's be honest. And in the same way that young man is there naked and vulnerable, the near Niskos, when we come face to face with the cross, we can't cover up. We see in the cross our brokenness and our vulnerabilities and our pains, and our hurts, and our betrayals, 
Those times when we have been denied. Those times when we have been rejected. Those times when we have been let down. It's all caught up in that particular moment. And we are there, like that young man, naked. Because we've got nothing to fall back on. This is our story that we see in that moment with Jesus upon the cross. We are that nihilistos. It is you, it is I, in that moment. And yet here, in the empty tomb, Neoniscos once again sitting there, pointing out to those women, Jesus isn't here anymore. And your task, perhaps our task, is to go and proclaim the resurrection. And what's he wearing? The most beautiful, wonderful, gorgeous white robe. He's changed. Neoniscos has changed. The resurrection has changed a young man. Very different to Matthew's gospel who talks about an angel at that moment. Mark's saying something very different here. Caught up, that young man like you and I, when we receive Jesus, when we say yes to the resurrection, when we are baptised, when we are confirmed, the white robe becomes ours. Not because of anything we've done, but because of all that Jesus has done, made visible to you and I in this moment in Mark's Gospel. So there's things to learn from the women. There's things to learn from this extraordinary young man who is there. Finally, I've always been struck in Mark's gospel that actually the women don't do as they are told. They are told to go and proclaim the resurrection. But Mark tells us that they are filled with both terror and amazement. So they don't say anything. Now, what I don't think Mark is saying here is that we need to live in a world where people are silenced. We've reflected so much, particularly since lockdown began, in terms of moments where things have been brushed under carpets and where people have been forced to be silent. Now, we know that that is not right, that each and every person has a voice to share their experiences both good and bad. Our wonderful confirmation candidates shared something of their experience with me just before the service began. But I do think Mark is saying here that silence, not being silenced, is important. There's something here, you see, face to face with the awesomeness of the resurrection. There are no words that we can use. No words can capture something of this extraordinary moment. I'm not surprised that those first women called to proclaim the resurrection are silenced as a result with the enormity of the task. They want to reflect about it. And I wonder what can we learn from that silence? Because it strikes me that so often with commentary and with comment and with whatever you can say in 160 characters or whatever it might be, we're so quick to put opinions and thoughts forward without necessarily reflecting on the big picture. We are caught up in all of those details. And I wonder here in 21st century London, whether we're just frightened of silence. And that's something that's come through so strongly in our time of lockdown, which has led to the extreme vulnerability and isolation of so many people. And I wonder how many of us in the church, how many of us in our Christian lives, really give space for silence because of the enormity of the resurrection. Space for God to speak. 
space for God's encounter, perhaps preferring the babble of verbal discourse at every turn. My friends, this is an extraordinarily important Easter for us. Here in London, as the Church of Jesus Christ, as the body of Christ. As we have a road map coming out of this lockdown, that added to Brexit and climate change, with the names of George Floyd and Sarah Everard and others all influencing our thinking and are reflecting. Each of these aspects are affecting God's love affair with his creation and his creatures. We weren't able to gather in this way this time last year, and that hurt. That really hurt. And we know that in the last two years, since last time we lit the Easter fire in this place, that life has changed. You've changed. I've changed. As individuals and as the body of Christ. We will never go back to the way in which it was before. That is impossible. But we have a role of creating the future. Rooted in the body of Christ, based upon kingdom values, living out the resurrection, the gifts of peace and love and forgiveness. And I hope and I pray that Mark's gospel influences your part in building that future. Keeping hold of the big picture and being up for being given particular tasks as that group of women were. By the end of that encounter, they weren't fussed about a body that needed to be anointed. They were on a mission. Learning from that young man that actually in the cross we see our own brokenness and we see our own vulnerability. Yet in the gift of the resurrection, the gift of baptism and new life, we see something very different and it's living that new life out. But in the meantime, as disciples, as lifelong learners, we give space, we create silence. Not having to fill every moment with a constant babble and bluster of our vanity. But in the resurrection, grace terrorises and sustains us in equal measure like those women and we give space for God to speak. Friends, may God's peace be yours this Easter and for all eternity. Amen.
Camillo.
Dann. risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then they were glad when they saw the risen Lord. Hallelujah. Friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And with thy spirit. Hallelujah.
Well, pleasing 